Hey guys, still here, and welcome to the open beta of Broken Arrow, or at least very soon. In this version of the beta, you'll be able to play the game for free. The link down to the, the Steam page is in the description. Um, you're going to have to build a battle group. Now, various other games call these battle groups, armies, decks, what have you. We call them battle groups over here. This video is going to focus on the American one. And as you can see, we have only, at least for now, two specializations. As the game is going to get more and more fleshed out, and upon release there will be more specializations, but for now, you only have two. We have the USMC, and we have the Armored Brigade. And you can see that this does something to the battle group size. Not only does it increase the battle group size from absolutely nothing to at least something, but it also forces you to start picking units in various categories. Let's have a look. Over here on the left we have Recon, Infantry, Vehicles, Supports, Helicopters and Airborne, aka Planes. Now this means that um, some tabs that you might be used to, especially myself as coming from Wargame and Warno, um, Tanks? Where's the Tank tab? That's Vehicles. Over the um, Recon units for example you have 0 out of 1500. This is the amount of points you can allocate here. So you do sort of get forced into a particular role, depending on what specializations you pick. Now, I did ask one of the developers, but they were not forthcoming on what type of specializations are going to be available in the full game. So we'll just have to wait and see about that. Now, once you start picking a unit, for example, in the recon tab, we have the cavalry scouts. These guys come with a whole host of different vehicles. They can even be brought in on foot. Now, if you do select on foot, that actually means that they're going to have to start walking in from the spawn line. Especially on larger maps, this is probably not something you want. But it is something you can use, and here's why. All of these vehicles can bring in units. But, for example, if I have the AMPV bringing in the cavalry scouts, the game then goes, ah, well, we got an AMPV available. Um, if I then bring Force Recon for the, with the Humvee, for example... I can say I want to have the Force Recon brought in in the AMPV. Here's how that looks. This is a shot taken from one of my recent games. You can see that I'm using the Russian deck in this case, or the Russian army. I have a couple of different infantry that I can call in, and I have a ton of different options to call them in with. So this is going to make your army very flexible when it comes to deployment. Now, this way of going about building a battle group kind of means that it is not that important who you bring in what. Because you might not necessarily be bringing them in that combination. In fact, you can even bring more than one unit in a vehicle. Especially if you're coming from Wargame or Warno, this is something otherworldly. In this situation, I have the Cavalry Scouts. Over here on the right hand side, you can see it's a three man team. Now, the AMPV seats six. This means I can bring in two cavalry scouts in one vehicle. And when you do that, that does give you the option to bring in more units for the same price of the vehicle. So you don't have to pay the 40 points for the AMPV twice. You just do that once. But your AMPV gets destroyed. Tough luck. You lose out on both cavalry scouts. Something else that you see over here is that the cav scouts currently only have one out of four. If I just up this, it's going to add more Cavalry Scouts, but not more vehicles. So if you want to have more of the vehicles, you're also going to have to plus these things up. If you change your mind and, well, actually, I don't want the um, Cavalry Scouts in the AMPV. I want them in the M3A2 CFV. You can just double click that or you can drag it over and it's going to add that to the vehicle or to the infantry. Now, there are a lot of different combinations, but as I said, they're not necessarily the ones you'll be making, because sometimes you might just want to have the cavalry scouts coming in in a helicopter. In this tab, you don't see helicopters, and this is where there's a sort of cross-pollination between the infantry tab and the helicopter tab. Helicopters can also have transportation capability. In this case, you got the UH-1Y Venom, or, for example, the Osprey, or the Super Stallion, or the King Stallion. The King Stallion is a very big helicopter. It seats 30 people. So you could call in one uh, King Stallion and bring in, for example, two groups of Marines. Again, with the risk that if they get shot down, well, uh, there go all the Marines as well. So in this case, be wary of how you transport your people. 
The next question then becomes, how do you start? Where do you start? Start at the overview of all your units. What category has the most points available to you? Where can you spend most? And in this particular specialization, which is the USMC Armored, you get a lot of potential points in vehicles. Now, that doesn't always mean that this deck, for example, or sorry, this army, is a battle group that focuses around tanks. Because tanks can add up in price very, very quickly. If you look at the M1A2 SEP3, this is currently going for 290 points. But if you go over to the bottom right hand side, you got the customization options. And over here you can change what sort of protection the tank has. Right now it has some base armor. It has 850 kinetic resistance and 1400 heat resistance on the front. We start tacking on more protection, such as the Tusk Plus, or sorry, the Tusk Armor Package. You can see the sides are going up. The next one, sides are going up by a substantial margin. And go all the way up to Tusk Armor and Trophy APS, which is an active protection system. So a missile comes in and it gets shot down before it reaches the tank. Although it only carries four charges. Then your tank has gone up to a price tag of 390 points. Now I've had the pleasure of going up against a couple of these gentlemen and they have proven extremely tough to kill. They're not immortal, nothing is, but these are very difficult to kill. They have their main gun, they have their M240, they got a couple of Brownings. Um, good luck trying to take these things out, because normally your answer might be, well I'm going to shoot an anti-tank missile at it. Sure, but the APS is going to stop that. So you're either going to have to overwhelm this thing with more firepower, as in numerically superiority, or potentially try and engage it from different directions at the same time, forcing it to show one of the weaker sides. Or of course you can drop a couple of ordinances on top. Maybe a cluster ammunition, uh, maybe an ATGM launched from an aircraft, although again an ATGM launched from an aircraft might get uh, stuck in the APS. Anyway, the price of the unit. I would take two of these, because these are very good tanks. If you can keep them alive, if you can take care of them, they will carry your battle group for quite a while. You can see, however, this has already spent 780 points over 3k. Considering that we're going pretty heavy on vehicles, I would also want to have some vehicles backing up the M1A2. Now, there might be the temptation that you go, well, I got all these nice APS kits, why would I not want to put them on? Sometimes you might not need to. Sometimes a tank might be good enough if it has, for example, just Tusk Armor. These guys are going to take the hits. These guys can take the hits. If you keep the M1A2 version 2 just slightly behind it, this does not necessarily take as many hits and can be far cheaper while still dishing out substantial amounts of damage. This way you can start building out your forces. So in this case, I would want to have a couple of these. I also want to have, let's say, four of these. And you can see that the price jumps from 390 to 275. So it's a substantial drop. You can also go with the M60A1. There's no customization. It's an old tank. It does not have anywhere near the same level of protection as the M1A2. I mean, we're looking 300 millimeters from the front versus 850. Or almost three times the amount of... Uh, chemical resistance, as they call it. So basically the amount of HGM that uses heat ammunition that it can take. But, well, you're paying less than a third of the price. And it's still a tank. An infantry unit's going to have to get somewhat close to it in order to deal damage. All the while, it's taking damage from the M240, the main gun, and the Browning. So don't immediately discard the M60. As for the M901A3, this as well as the LAV-AT, are anti-tank vehicles. They only carry an M240, they only have anti-tank missiles, they are not meant for frontline combat. This is going to go down very quickly if it gets hit by a tank. It has almost no armor. But it does have a very good anti-tank missile. This one comes with the LAV-AT TOW-2A. This comes with a TOW-2B. Now sometimes you're going to see indicators like this. Top armor attack. This is going to be very important when you're dealing with very heavily armored tanks, such as the M1A2. 
Because if you're looking at the front, this thing has 850, or in case of an ATGM, 1400 points of resistance. So the missile, let's say uh, it's going to be the TOW 2, it's going to have a... Oh, sorry, this is the, the top attacker. Uh, this one is going to have a very hard time pinning that level of armor. Good luck. But the top is an entirely different story. Because you're penning 80 millimeters kinetic. And that means, all of a sudden, this thing is no longer as secure as it might want to be. Because it only has 60 points there. So with this, an ATGM, you can still kill something really, really dangerous like the M1A2 SEP. You're going to have to bring the right missile though. But the right missile is more expensive. You're paying 25 points more for the LAV-80 modernized. And this is where you're going to have tons and tons and tons of customization. If you find that during your battles you might struggle to kill extremely heavily armored tanks, maybe these guys can be an easy answer. But there's always more than one way to deal with the unit. You could, for example, go, oh, well, there's a couple of tanks over there. I'm going to go and call in the MLRS. But the MLRS right now is carrying high explosive. It can do damage with heat. Great. But I want something a bit more deadly. I want cluster munitions. And these guys, much like the TOW 2B, are top attack armor. So these guys will attack from the top and can pen 200 millimeters using all of these little cluster munitions. The Attackums does 400 uh, millimeters of heat. And the problem is you only get two shots. Two shots only. And then they're going to sit there for the next 50 to 70 seconds reloading, costing a thousand points of supplies. Whereas a standard cluster might not cost you as much in supply. Uh, it might not be as deadly. The reload time is about similar, but the magazine size is far more substantial. So this is again a way to potentially take out that tank. Let's continue building this particular army out. We're going to have the M1A2 SEP. These guys are their, let's say, their best friends. Uh, they will provide additional fire support, dealing with enemy infantry, dealing with enemy armor, because they might not be as advanced as the V3, but they can still pack a substantial punch. In case you want to see exactly how much that is, and you find all of these stats a little intimidating, switch over to the, let's say, the simplified view, and you can immediately see how much of the ammunition type they carry, what their effective range is going to be, as well as how much they can damage. So in this case, this gun can pen 400 millimeters of heat armor or 500 millimeters kinetic. Um, the amount of damage is nine for the heat round or six for the kinetic round. Contrast that, if you will, by using the pin icon and it's going to pin that unit and you can put the other one right next to it. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, here we go, yep. So by comparing them, you can see that um, it's the same gun, but slightly different projectile. And this fires the, yeah, this fires the 829A3. This fires the 829A4. So it might be the same tank. It might even be the same gun. But if it doesn't fire the same projectile, you're going to have to make these comparisons and see if this tank does, in fact, have the same kill power as the other one. Now... I want to have these guys in. I also want to have a couple of the cheaper Abrams. And this is where it gets somewhat confusing potentially because you have the M1A2 SEP, you got the M1A2 Abrams, the HC, but this is the M1A1, and you got the M1A1 FEP. So what are the differences? Well, there's not a whole lot. For example, if you're contrasting uh, price units or units which are fairly similar in price, the M1A2 as well as the M1A1 FEP, there's really not that many differences. Um, this thing is slightly lighter, although you wouldn't notice it in the terms of engine speed. But the M1A1 FEP does have a different type of protection system. It can come with a jammer, and that could be very useful because a jammer is going to be able to throw off incoming missiles. That is going to work next to your ability to pop smoke. So you have a couple of incoming missiles, maybe your tank's taking a bit of damage, you pop a smoke and your tank suddenly becomes concealed. If you, however, start spending a lot, then all of a sudden these things are 300 points. 
So be wary as to how much you really want to spend on the tank and how it's going to fit in the battle group. And this is where I think the game is going to offer you endless amounts of customization and time in the editor, figuring out what type of unit you need. Because maybe after five games you realize, well, this tank is good, but I wish it would last a little longer. I'm going to put a trophy on it. That, of course, does blossom the price. So the next couple of matches you might go, yeah, okay, um, it survived for longer, but I don't have enough guns on the battlefield. I'm going to drop back down to base armor. Or I might need to bring the M60. These are all sorts of questions that really only you can answer as you're playing the game. Now, this is a way that I would potentially build it out. Um, I'm also going to bring a couple of the LEV ATs in case I need something in my toolkit, because that's how I consider this particular battle group as a toolkit. I want a couple of tools in my armory or in my toolkit to deal with heavy armor, such as the LAV ATM. Now, I still have some points left. This is where I would not necessarily pick additional units. I mean, you could pick an M1A18C and go with uh, a couple of nice upgrades and then go, yeah, I'm pretty close to that. But you just have one tank. When do you call this guy in? I would like to have some simplicity in my decks, in my battle groups. So in this case, I'm going to go, okay, this is my heavy hitter. These are my, let's say, second rate tanks. These are potentially third rate tanks in the sense that they're not necessarily the ones that I call in immediately. But if the enemy has a lot of infantry, these can be very useful. And these are the ones that I call once the enemy has brought in their, let's say their T-15 or their T-14. The really heavily armored platforms. But I still have some points left. Well, I can spend that on a bit of extra armor. And keep in mind that this does not add just 10 points. But because I have four of these units, it adds 40 points. As for the M60, not much to upgrade there. Uh, the M1A2 SEP... Already has a pretty good armor package, but I could upgrade that to the trophy protection. And with that, I'm suddenly at almost 3k. Almost maxed it out. Alright, what comes next? Infantry. Because these guys can't very well fight in a town all by themselves. I'm going to need infantry. And this is where you're kind of going to have to start making choices about how do you want the infantry to be brought in. Do you want the infantry to come in by the means of airborne? Is that safe? Do you want them to be brought in pretty quick in the form of an MTVR, which is basically a truck? Or are you going to go with a bit more armor? You can see that these guys only have a forward speed of 70 versus 105. You might be able to get them there very quickly, but if your truck gets, well, blown up before it gets there, what good is your infantry? So again, a lot of different choices. As I mentioned, don't get too stuck up on what exactly you bring your infantry in on. I'd be more interested in what type of options do I have available. Because sometimes you might not necessarily have the right amount of seats. Um, for, especially for the smaller vehicles like a Humvee. A Humvee is only going to seat four, which is great for fire support teams such as the small and the tow team. Uh, it'll also work for the light riflemen. But... Oh, sorry, it will not work for the light rifle because they got six. Um, don't try and turn it into a clown car and pack a whole group of marines in there. 13 marines will not fit in the Humvee. So if you want to have the marines and you're going to bring them in on foot, you're going to have to really think, what else am I going to bring in this particular deck, sorry, battle group, that is capable of carrying these marines? Now, in this case, I want to have a couple of these things, the AAV-7. And with this, I want to have a bit of additional armor. If these guys can last a little longer, great. I'm going to have a couple of marines. I'm going to have, let's say, three of these. Because I'll never really call in all the marines at once. Um, and this means that once one of these vehicles gets destroyed, it might eventually come back. But I'll have a little bit of spare capacity before that. Next up, let's bring some anti-air infantry, just to make sure I have it already. Don't go and spend everything, for example, on uh, very expensive mech riflemen in very expensive Bradleys and suddenly go, oh, right, um, how am I going to deal with any, any uh, air threats? How am I going to deal with helicopters? 
try and balance out your toolkit before you start splurging on particular uh, buys. In this case, we're going to have a couple of the mech riflemen. These guys are six man strong. Keep in mind that they might have a stinger, but they also have some fire support weapons. So it's not like they're a two man stinger team that dies instantly when it comes into contact with any infantry unit. They will put up some fight. In this case, I'm going to have these guys brought in um, in something that's cheaper than a Bradley, but not necessarily too expensive. So I think the AMPV is fine. You could, if you want to, upgrade these to have a Bushmaster and a Javelin. Because this gives me a bit of everything. It gives me an anti-infantry team in the form of a vehicle. It gives me an anti-tank capability in the form of the Javelin. And I get anti-air in the form of the infantry. So it's a... Well, a mini army, if you will. It can do a bit of everything. I wouldn't necessarily bring too many of these because the Stinger is okay, but its range is somewhat limited. Next up, I want to have some Bradleys. The Bradleys are there for their auto cannons. They're there to provide fire support. Now you get a couple of different variants. We got the M2A2, we got the M2A3, we got the M2A3 ESV, and the M2A3 ESV. These are a couple of different vehicles that just have slightly different capabilities. If I compare these guys to each other, the M2A2 and the M2A2 ASV, you can see that, let's use the simplified view, they both have an anti-tank missile, but the use is slightly different. Because this thing, the TOW-2, can pen 900 millimeters of armor. This thing can pen 75. Okay, so what's the deal with the BLOM? What is that? It's a TOW BB, I'm not sure if that's an actual missile or a placeholder. And whereas the TOW 2 can target only vehicles, this thing can also target infantry, which would make it very valuable in a fire support role. More so, potentially, than the Humvee, sorry, than the, the Bradley, which has the TOW 2A. But, and here we go again, it gives me the capability of dealing with armor, and this thing, not as much. I mean, it's not a top attacker. I didn't accidentally miss that. No, it just does not have any. So if I want to have some fire support for my infantry, um, maybe I need a Bradley. And I would probably want to bring the Bradley with the tow missile. So I'm going to go with the Bradley M2A3. I have a couple of different options. I can go with the Mech Rifleman or I can have them be brought in with the Mech Rifleman. The difference between these infantry units is these guys have an AT4, so an anti-tank weapon. These guys do not. They're basically a machine gun team. I want to have these guys with the Bradley. Now this is going to ramp up the price quick. If you give these guys Busk 3 armor, that is ERA, look at what that does to the, <laughs> the base level of armor. Uh, your base level of armor against kinetics goes up by 20 points, but against chemical rounds by 400. Sorry, by 300. We're going from 100 to 300. The side's similar, so their survivability is suddenly a heck of a lot better, but... Call in a couple of these guys and you're going to blow through your points very quickly. If you want a protection system like the Iron Fist, that is their version of the trophy, their active protection system. Cha-ching, that's another 25 points. Would you like it to go standard speed or faster? Cha-ching, another 10 points. Yeah, it adds up. And it adds up quick. I'm going to have a couple more mech riflemen. And um, I would basically do this for all the vehicles. I would want to have, let's say, a few more of the infantry than I have of the vehicle. Because my vehicle might be able to drop off the infantry and then return to base. Whereas the infantry, if it dies, well, it's going to respawn eventually, but it'll take a while. So I don't necessarily need all the vehicles. I just want to have a couple of different options. Tow team, for example, I'm going to go bring them in on foot. I don't need anything. I don't need a Humvee. I can just bring them in in a helicopter. And the tow team can be switched from the tow 2A, so the front attacker, to the tow 2B, which is a top attacker. Not sure how comfortable this gentleman is over here, but uh, let's say that's a placeholder animation. So I'm going to bring these guys in on foot, and I'm going to bring a couple of these tow teams in order to deal with enemy threats, which happen to come out of a vehicle. Marine Raiders, these guys are very good at dealing with enemy infantry, not so good at dealing with vehicles. They do come with the M72A10 law, but also a grenade launcher. And that's if you use them as door kickers. If you use them as standoffs, well, <laughs> here we go again. And it changes 
because suddenly they are much better at keeping the enemy at range with a couple of sniper rifles, the M110K1. They also get the uh, MAAWS, the MAWS, which is far more deadly than the version that the door kickers had, the LAW. But they lose the grenade launcher. In this case, I'm going to have them as specific door kickers. So they're not going to be that useful against enemy vehicles. But if they can get some fire support, maybe from a couple of Bradleys or the AAV-7A1, well, that'd be great. So let's call them in uh, on foot and in the door kicker customization. Now it gives me about 100 points left. I could call in a dragon team. I find that the dragon team is not really that different from the tow team or the saber team. Very similar. Very similar. Weapon-wise, that is. Because these are four-man squads and these are eight-man squads. So they got a lot more hit points. Um, when it comes to their firepower, this anti-tank weapon is just not really going to cut it against, let's say, the Tow 2 a um, It's got a lot less range, although the effective range is 100 meters versus 200. So these guys just need more range to maneuver. These guys don't need as much. Supply cost is also cheaper for this missile. Um, damage is less. Damage is far better. Expressive power almost twice. So yeah, you're going to have to make a choice here. Do you want to have additional teams or additional marines, for example? Or do you want to have something else? I'm going to go with... I want to have a couple of additional infantry units. And if I use another of these, I'm exactly at 2k. So I got some door kickers, very specialized marines. I got the general marines. Um, I have my NTR. I have my, my mech riflemen, which are basically general infantry as well. And I have these guys coming in at Bradley. All right then, what comes next? Well, we haven't really gotten around to the recon tab yet. Recon is where you spot everything. This brings in the information about what goes where and what do I shoot with what. A couple of different options. Infantry, Cav Scouts, Force Recon, Scout Snipers. Scout Snipers, mostly concealed fighters. Passive Recon, so you don't actively engage an enemy with them. You can, if you really want to, set them into the battlefield with the 107 anti-materiel rifle. This is going to allow them to deal damage against lightly armored targets, and they might be able to sneak through a line, and potentially, where they're um, going to encounter, let's say, anti-air systems or artillery systems, destroy that with their anti-materiel rifle. If you think, well, that's a bit too fancy for me, I don't plan to do that with them, give them the M40, and you have a cheap sniper. They also come with something that calls laser designation. This means that they're going to be able to laser a target for another unit. Sometimes you're going to have, for example, a laser guided bomb on a plane, and this is going to be able to pull in that plane, or at least point the plane in the right direction. Laser designating. Now, how would I call these in? Um, I would probably call these in on foot, because I want to call them in on a helicopter. What else do we got? Force recon. Basically, your active scouts. Two different loadouts. Black Ops or Green Ops. Green Ops, kind of as discussed, is uh, all-rounder. Black Ops is short-range shotguns. I'm going to have these guys as all-rounders, so I'm going to bring a couple of Force Recon gentlemen. Let's say I want to have four of these. Um, I think Humvees are fine. You do get the option to call in the LV-2. Oh, sorry, the LV-25. And with that, you can again upgrade what they can do. This one also gets an upgrade to its optics, so its own optics get better. Could be useful, especially if you use this as a sort of secondary recon unit. But it does not do as well as the specific recon version of the Bradley. Because this one has 1700 meters or 1700 points of optics. This guy, 2000. But it's pricey, and it only comes attached to the cavalry scouts. Um, you also can go, well, I would like something that looks like a Bradley, uh, but that just has a different loadout. Because, for example, this guy comes with a tow missile, and this guy does not. Although, you can at least change it, um, and you can make it really expensive. But, well, you'll not get a tow missile. So if you want to have a recon unit that not only spots, but also shoots, especially at tanks with tow missiles, you can. Now, how would I bring these in? 
Um, I'm not sure I would. I'm not necessarily sure I would. I would probably want to have a couple of these. And, well, a couple is really all that you're going to get. These are my active scouts that move with the tanks. My tanks are the ones that deal the damage. These are the spotters that can defend themselves. And, with all that armor, it does make them expensive. But they can hold their own, at least for a little bit of time on the battlefield. They are also able to laze targets. So, if I have a target that needs some laser-guided attention, these guys can laze it and somebody else can kill it. As for um, the M981, this thing is a bit of an odd duck. It looks like it has an anti-tank missile, but it actually does not. It's a bit of a mirage. It only has a machine gun. That's really all that it has. You can increase the armor, you can give it slat armor. It's a pretty good spotter, which is pretty uh, cheap for what it does, but it dies very quickly. I personally wouldn't take this. You can also bring something that is <laughs> far smaller and lots cheaper that will also die pretty quickly to enemy armor. Well, to enemy anything, really. It has no armor. Uh, the IFV, sorry, IFAV M2. But these things can have pretty serious teeth. Arm these things with a TOW 2 missile and all of a sudden you have a very mobile reconnaissance unit that can also kill armor. Why not? I'm going to have a couple of these. When it comes to the M1A2 SCP recon version, I think it's very expensive. You only get one for 350 points, and at least that would complete my recon tab. If you want to bring two of these, that's half your recon points gone, at least in this particular specialization. So pick wisely and decide what would suit your needs best. In my case... Um, I haven't actually tried this unit. I think it's very expensive, but it is a tank. So, yeah, considering I have a tank focus, might as well. Next up, supports. This is where you find all sorts of supports. Um, if you're coming from Wargame, this is where Logi hides, logistics units. This is where mortars sit. This is also where artillery sits. And this is where your NTR lives. So you get all sorts of support units in the same tab. Now, let's go with the logistics first, because if you cannot resupply your units in the field, they will run out of ammo, they will run out of health, and you simply cannot repair it. When it comes to organization of these particular icons, I think this can be done a little better, because you got the LVSR for resupply, you got the MCV, sorry, um, and you got the, this one, the M548. Those are the reconnaissance, no, the resupply options that you have. Um, I would... Ideally put these like next to each other to make it a bit easier to see what's what and what it does. But okay, uh, this is what we have. I would bring a couple of these LVSRs because you never know when you're going to need supplies. These things can carry 15,000 points of supplies. And this means that you can click the unit to call it in. And then click a couple of times on the amount of supplies that you want to bring them in. Now it is a truck. So... Yeah, it's never going to be very heavily armored, but you can give it some more armor. You can even give it a grenade launcher. Um, this is going to make the vehicle, again, more expensive. If you're a bit more careful with your logistics, you can just keep it pretty cheap. So we have a resupply unit. I also want to have something that can reach out and touch the enemy from very far away. And that can be the Paladin. The Paladin has two different loadouts, high explosive or a cluster. This is going to be very useful against armor. I'm not sure how well it's going to do against infantry. I haven't properly tested that yet. The cluster type tends to be more effective against infant oh, sorry, against vehicles than against infantry. High explosive is the other way around. Now these guys, Excalibur rounds, as you can see potentially by the indicator here, laser guided. So let's say your sniper team spots something very valuable, maybe enemy artillery, maybe reconnaissance, or sorry, maybe uh, NTR. You can then have them laze the target, and this Excalibur round is going to land very neatly almost right on top of them. Dispersion, 150 to 200 meters. Standard dispersion is a bit more, 280 to 210. So the laser guided shell is a bunch more accurate, but you only get three shells, so pick wisely. As for the cluster, you don't get a laser guided option. Oh, sorry, no, you do get a laser guided option. You get this one. Uh, top attacker, cluster, 
could be, let's say, an anti-tank sniper. But this thing snipes your anti-tank, or it snipes your tank from about 4,000 meters away. I would probably bring these with HE. And just one, at least early. Uh, well, initially. I'm going to have a couple of different mortars. I want to have uh, a mortar that I don't need to resupply very often. And you got the LAV... Oh, sorry, this is also a resupply vehicle. My bad. So you got the LVSR, the LAVL, and the M548. Those are your resupply options. The LAVM is an, um, a mortar carrier. And this one I would just bring without the standard or without any upgrades. Because ideally my mortars wouldn't take any fire. Mortars are perfectly versatile to both shell units with high explosive as well as put down smoke. Giving you all sorts of options. Oh, and they're amphibious and they can even get airdropped. So you get tons of options with these beauties. Then, further options in the tab. Anti-air. We've got the pivads. We've got the LAVAD. These units perform a pretty similar role. But one has a bit more mobility. 100 points of mobility versus 70. But you're paying through the nose. 140 points versus 70. But, not quite the same weapon. And these guys have stingers. So these, the LAVADs, uh, very potent weapons, can also be used against infantry, much like these. But unfortunately the Pevads does not get a stinger, and a stinger might just be able to finish off a unit from slightly farther away. I think the LAVAD is a bit more versatile, I'll bring two of these. I'm also going to bring a Patriot, and the Patriot is there to deal with enemy planes from very great ranges, 600 to 4000 meters, uh, don't mind the icon. Weapon package can be either two missiles or four, and you can see the canister changes. This does mean your unit is going to be more expensive, um, and might be a greater target for the enemy. This thing can, well, it can shut down an airspace pretty efficiently. I would probably want to have a second anti-air unit, like an LEVAD, or potentially uh, a stinger team in the front line to help them finish something off, but well, this works. Linebackers are great options to go with your offensive line. So with your tanks. Not the first line, second line. These guys have a couple of different options, but they're all focused mostly on dealing with air threats. You got the Shore Rad, which has uh, a unit or a projectile that can hit a helicopter from a thousand meter range. This thing can do that from... Oh, sorry, this thing cannot shoot a helicopter. Then we got the uh, M Shore Rad, which gives you not so much a stinger, but a hellfire. So all of a sudden, this uh, Bradley, let's say, has changed its role and is going to do all sorts of dangerous and <laughs> different things. Um, HEDP, high explosive dual purpose, can deal with infantry, can deal with helicopters, and can even deal with missiles. Some missiles can get shot down. So, for versatility's sake, let's bring one of these. Make it two, actually. Uh, oh, I didn't actually add the Patriot yet. I don't care about self-defense packages, really. If this thing starts shooting, something has gone horribly wrong. But, well, you could make the case for it. Because if you put just a grenade launcher or a heavy machine gun on it, and you find that, uh, well, enemies start sneaking behind your lines, maybe the anti-air will kill that unit all by itself. You won't even have to pay attention. I'm just going to put a bit of additional armor on it and make sure that it survives a little longer. I'll take two of those. We might come back to this in a bit. Helicopters. <clears throat> um, we get a couple of different options. Some of them armed, some of them not so armed. You want something that does a lot of damage. You can go with the Cobra line. Um, the AH-1Z Viper, for example, has a couple of different customization options. This one is mostly very, very versatile. Sidewinders, so dealing with enemy helicopters. Guided rockets to deal with, well, pretty much anything. Infantry, vehicles, it doesn't really matter. This thing can take most of them out, except tanks. And the inner pylons is eight hellfires. Does make them expensive. Want something a bit cheaper? Maybe get a Viper with a couple of uh, rocket pods. And I'll just forego these. And all of a sudden you have a, a Viper that's only 170 points. Units like these tend to also come with flares, and they will pop these out themselves. If they're empty, um, yeah, good luck. Yeah, that missile that's coming at you will likely hit, so beware of that. 
You also have a couple of different transport options here. The Super Stallion, the King Stallion, the Osprey, and the Venom. These are all options that are going to allow you to transport the infantry that you've selected in the Infantry tab. So, for example, the tow teams and the Marine Raiders don't have a transport attached. You can bring those in the helicopter. Let's say I want to have something fast, something versatile, this one. Now, the Osprey can be armed. It can be armed with a minigun. Uh, it's not going to be a particularly great defense. Oh, sorry, it's in the... That was in the door, but never mind. Um, it's going to allow you to at least shoot some targets. And this is not the only weapon it gets. It gets the GAU-21. That's the one you're seeing here. I'm really not sure what the other weapon is. Normally, you actually see it. Anyway, uh, the GAU-17 is going to also allow it to do even more damage against enemy infantry. I'm going to have one of these. They seat 26. So you can just bring a lot of people in. They are very visible, though. They are very fast. And they can transport supplies. So you can also bring them in to transport supplies. They are very, very versatile. When it comes to something cheaper, I'm going to have a Venom. And this Venom is going to be bringing my infantry right close to the front line. So let's say a couple of miniguns. And maybe some pylons with a couple of rocket pods. Hydras for high explosive damage. This one is much more focused around dealing with enemy armor. Uh, enemy vehicles. This is just to suppress enemy infantry. So let's go with a couple of Hydras. And I'll take two of those. And the rest is going to go into Vipers and Super Cobras. Super Cobras only has two different pylons available. You can bring Hydra Rockets. And you can bring, well, anything under the sun and the outer pylons. You can bring Sidearms. These are anti-radiation missiles. So they'll seek out and destroy enemy radar guided into here. Sidewinders for dealing with enemy helicopters, Hellfires for dealing with tanks, uh, Tow 2 AT, which is pretty similar to the Hellfire. I think the Hellfire is slightly better. You got 900 millimeters of heat there versus 900 millimeters of heat here. Is this a fire and forget? This is laser guided. I think this is not. Yeah, there's the difference. So a laser guided missile can potentially be more deadly. I suspect. You can also say, well, I think 8 tow 2 missiles is a bit much. I'll bring 4. I'll bring Hydras or just standard or smaller rocket pods. Or nothing. You can just bring nothing. You can unfortunately not bring nothing there. And just have it as a very, very cheap gunship for a 95 points. But, well, there might be a case for this. Because this uh, auto cannon is going to come in very useful. And a bit of rocket pod fire has, well, I was going to say it never hurt anybody. But I guess it did. A lot. In my case, I want to have these as fire support units. Let's say with light anti-tank capability. So I'll take two of those. No, I'll take one of those. I'm then going to make one very expensive Viper. AH-1Z. I'm going to bring Hellfires. I'm going to bring on the outer tips uh, AP APKWS guided rockets. And over here, I'm going to bring a couple of sidearms to deal with enemy radar. That's 290 points of helicopter. One unit. Try not to lose it. Finally, planes. Now, looking at all the things that we have here, what is going to make for a couple of useful planes? What would be a great asset to this particular deck? I think that we have a bit of everything covered. We have in tier. We can deal with planes threatening our tanks. We can deal with, for example, helicopters dealing with our tanks. Um, we can deal with enemy infantry using mortars or the paladin we can deal with enemy infantry using our own marines but maybe something to make sure that death doesn't rain on top of us that could be useful now i can bring the f-35b this is a multi-role plane and it has quite a number of options you can mix and match these so you can say well i want to have these things with one amram and I want to have the other one with, for example, Stormbreaker missiles. Sorry, uh, these are not missiles. These are low drag bombs. With a range of 4,000 meters, they'll do a bit of damage. And they can be laser guided. They also got the JSO, which is the uh, joint standoff weapon, I think it is. Lots more damage. Also lots more expensive. Just a uh, very hefty bomb. <laughs> 1,000 pounder bomb. But cheaper. This thing is laser-guided. 
does quite a bit of damage when it comes to HE, I think. Blast radius 120. Blast radius 120. Suppressive power. Huh. Damage 36. Damage 7. There. This thing is much more precise. <clears throat> Top attack weapon. This thing is not. This thing is laser guided, but you just drop it and, well, good luck to it. It doesn't specifically top attack enemy armor. Smaller bombs, which are cheaper or more MRAMs, so you can turn it into something that resembles a fighter. I would not necessarily waste the F-35B as a fighter. I would probably put, well, I think one of these and one of those. Uh, whoops. So let's say I want to have the port side bay be Stormbreaker. And I want to have the starboard bay be uh, maybe another MRAM. <clears throat> the plane also comes standard with two MRAMs. So you can see I have three MRAMs now and a couple of these Stormbreakers. I'll take two of these as I happen on the receiving end. Thank you very kindly, Mr. <coughs> Noise Guy. That hurt a lot. <laughs> Those F-35Bs did a ton of damage. The KC-130J Harvest Hawk I'm going to bring as a standard cargo plane to kick people out of, I mean, airdrop people <clears throat> um, in case I need something like that quickly. And you can even airdrop supplies and vehicles to some extent, but not all vehicles. And then we're going to have the Hornet, which is currently carrying a couple of AMRAMs. I'm going to have more AMRAMs. Unfortunately, it is five points over budget. Well, shit. I'm going to have to save on something. Um, I can get additional fuel tanks, which would make it slightly cheaper. Or I can get sparrows. Sparrows are slightly shorter range, I think. Yeah, 1,000 to 5,000. This is 2,000 to 4,000. And sidewinders are for short range engagements. And now... I am five points shy. Gives me a little bit of supply points. What would I like in those? Um, why not the high Mars? High Mars can be pretty flexible. Because again, with the high Mars, you can have a high explosive loadout, cluster, uh, ATACAMS, or PRSM, which is a ballistic missile. They only carry two, but this thing leaves a hell of an impact once it actually goes off. Could be the fantastic counter to enemy artillery. Let's say I got 200 points left. I'll bring another Paladin. Uh, actually, no, I'll bring another resupply unit, but I have a few too many units in the in the slots here. Oh, whatever. I'll bring another Paladin. So, um, that's what a battle group can look like. But, whereas with Wargame, for example, you could go, well, this is, let's say, a fairly optimal deck. With this particular battle group, I'm not so sure. Because it really depends on who's playing it, where you're playing it, how you're playing it. Um, you got all sorts of options. Now, this video turned into a video that's far longer than I was expecting. But then again, it is something, uh, this game, that takes a lot of time to explain. I hope I helped you. If I did, please hit the like button. If uh, you have any further questions, let me know down below in the comments. And, um, well, I hope to see you out on the battlefield in Broken Arrow.